Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Mike Friedman, the 113th president of the National Press Club, and what an honor it is to have this as the first program on my watch this year. As the former general manager of CBS Radio Network News and former managing editor for the broadcast division of United Press International, The Boys on the Bus was required reading. And I had the pleasure and the challenge of having on my UPI team one of those boys, the legendary Pi Chamberlain of UPI. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of you knew Pi Chamberlain. <laughs> Looking forward to a terrific discussion this evening. And now I have the pleasure of introducing the chair of the National Press Club History and Heritage Team, the 87th president of the National Press Club, the bureau chief of the Gaylord News Washington Bureau for University of Oklahoma, and a dear friend, Mr. Gil Klein. Thanks so much, Mike. The role of the National Press Club's History and Heritage Group is to promote the legacy of the club's 112-year history, as well as to explore the history of journalism, especially in Washington. We are pleased that on April 27th, a new book, New History of the Club, called Tales from the National Press Club, is scheduled to be published by the History Press. It explores events that happened at the club that have had an impact on American and world history. This event uh, tonight was proposed by our moder moderator, Edwin Grosvenor, who himself is part of the great Washington journalism Grosvenor family. For generations, they published National Geographic magazine, founded by Ed's great-grandfather, Alexander Graham Bell, oh, who, by the way, invented the telephone. Uh, Ed is now editor and publisher of the American Heritage magazine, a magazine that has inspired generations of young historians. Uh, Ed is also the publisher of uh, 13 history, uh, excuse me, Ed is also the author and editor of 13 uh, history books, and he's a third generation club member. Ed will introdu introduce our distinguished panel, who not only were on the campaign chronicled by Timothy Krause's book, The Boys on the Bus, but who also covered presidential politics in many of the 12 elections that have followed. We will have about an hour with our panel, and then we will open it up to questions from the floor. I will pass around a microphone for you so you can question, uh, so, um, so your question can be picked up by C-SPAN. I ask you to ask succinct questions, and if you ramble, the microphone might disappear. Immediately after the program, please join us uh, for a reception for our guests. Ed. Thanks so much for doing this. The floor is yours. Thank you, Gil, and uh, also congratulations on your book that just came out on Lafayette Square. I don't know how you found so many good history stories on, from one amazing, great book. Well, welcome, everybody. We're really pleased with this, this crowd. Um, we're going to have a lively discussion tonight about political campaigns and PAC journalism, uh, specifically about the experiences of our three distinguished panel members. Um, when the Boys in the Bus book came out, a reviewer in Kirkus wrote that it described a whole gaggle of political reporters, pundits, pontificators, network glamour boys, fawners, drunks, fornicators, wire service virtuosos, hacks, hatchet men, comers, all crammed like monkeys with typewriters in the press bus, frenetically dogging the candidates, all looking for a piece of the story, something to peg their best words on. Now, that may be a little, <laughs> a little over the top, um, but the book really did provide a fascinating window into how we learn about political campaigns and the people who bring those stories to us, like the distinguished journalists on our panel. Um, for most of you, uh, they don't need an introduction, but I'll give brief ones anyway. Uh, Carl uh, Lubstorff on my left is the columnist for the Dallas Morning News. 
and was that paper's Washington bureau chief for nearly three decades. Uh, on the bus, he covered the McGovern campaign for AP, which gave him a special status, uh, with the reporters looking over his shoulder to see what his lead was <laughs> the next morning. Um, Carl is the past president of both the Gridiron Club and the White House Correspondents Association, where he had the distinction of being roasted by Jon Stewart. Um, Carl recently published his memoirs entitled, appropriately, Adventures of a Boy on the Bus. Uh, Tom Oliphant, you all know, uh, uh, Cruz reports that Tom was known as the kid on the bus. Even though he had worked for the Boston Globe already for four years, uh, after the 72 campaign, he helped manage the Globe's uh, coverage of school desegregation in Boston, which won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, Tom was later the longtime Washington correspondent for the Globe and reported on 10 presidential campaigns. <laughs> He's been a frequent commentator on PBS and the networks, known for his insight, wit, and handsome bow ties. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's also written five books, including most recently, The Road to Camelot, with fellow boy, Curtis Wilkie. Connie Chung, we're, last but not least, we're so delighted that Connie's come down from New York to join us. A true pioneer, she was only the second female co-anchor um, to co-anchor a network newscast as part of CBS Evening News, and has also been an anchor and reporter for NBC, ABC, CNN and MSNBC. That's in demand. Couldn't hold a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tim Krause in the book refers that Connie disrupted the cozy, clubby male world of the boys on the bus by always showing up well prepared, bright and early, with microphone ready, and never hung over. <laughs> and never what? <laughs> and, and never hung over. <laughs> All right. It was a real advantage. It was a real advantage. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you about that. Well, that was the implication. Yeah, All right. <laughs> um, so anyway, first of all, I was wondering if each of you could <laughs> tell us, uh, just tell us briefly how, how you came to be on the, uh, on the campaign in 72, and where were you in your career at the time? Well, you've, of course, given most of my career, and at least since that date. I had joined the AP in 1960 out of Columbia Journalism School. I was assigned to the Tampa Bureau. Fortunately, three days after I was assigned there, a spot opened up in the New Orleans Bureau. And I figured New Orleans got to be more interesting than Tampa. And what I didn't know was they were about to desegregate the schools there, and it was about to get very interesting. And for the next three years, I covered a lot of desegregation, mostly the legal end of it. And in, these, in June of 1963, after a brief tenure in New York, I got to the Washington Bureau, um, courtesy of my New Orleans bureau chief who put in a good word for me. This, how long ago this was? This was six months before John Kennedy was killed, although the day that Kennedy was shot, I was due to come in at 10.30 at night when I called in, when I heard what happened, I called in and said, should I come in now? They said, no, come in at 10.30. You can see I wasn't very significant in the AP <laughs> Bureau at that point. Um, but as the World War II generation of journalists began to retire and die off, spots began to open up. And in the mid-60s, I covered the House of Representatives for two years. Um, then I covered the Senate for several years. And in the 68 campaign, I spent some of the campaign covering Hubert Humphrey's campaign. And I, by the time 1972 came around, I was uh, one of the main AP political writers along with Walter Mears, another boy who still is around in North Carolina. And I was assigned mostly to McGovern. And I covered McGovern virtually the whole year. And uh, after that, I stayed with the AP a couple of years, but I went to the Baltimore Sun at the end of 1975. I thought I would probably always go to work for a newspaper, and they gave me a good offer to cover politics in the White House. And in 1981, a former editor of mine from the AP named Burl Osborne became the editor of the Dallas Morning News and hired me to be the Washington bureau chief. And as you correctly said, I lasted 28 years as bureau chief, and I retired 10 years ago 
but I'm still writing the column I wrote all those years. That's how I got where I got. Tom? 1972 was my second of 11 presidential uh, campaigns. Um, I had uh, covered uh, Bob Kennedy and George Wallace in 1968, uh, but 72, uh, I started in New Hampshire, where I met this one, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so that was, that was my, uh, that was my second. Um, Tom and I are actually about the same age, but I, but we didn't. Well, we shared the, the number of a bit ago, but that's off the record. And, What's that? Uh, we shared we, the number. Of, oh, uh, but we, but it's off the record. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but we, uh, but he had a lot more experience than I did. Um, I had just started at CBS News, um, and I was in my mid twenties. I had only been there a few months, and I was suddenly assigned to cover George McGovern's 72 presidential campaign. I was really surprised. Um, but it was, it was great, but I, I was a cub reporter. The third string, in other words, usually there was a first string correspondent, and that was Bruce Morton primarily. And he was smart and respected by even the print journalists. The print journalists did not respect any television journalists, <laughs> truly. I mean, we were, you know, people who talked for a living, didn't think about what we were saying. We were uh, glamour bo boys. But Bruce was good, and I think most people respected him. There was a second string, and um, Often that was David Schumacher, or who was very aggressive, and I would then be bumped down to third banana. So I primarily called, uh, covered for radio. That was my job. <coughs> and I, I obviously didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> but I, I persevered. So there's a lot of uh, interesting details in this book. Uh, what, what did you guys think when it came out? And why, just briefly, why do you think we're still reading it today? Well, I was just happy my name was in it and my picture was in it. <laughs> I didn't like the picture much, but it's better than no picture. <laughs> I'm not really sure. I think it captures a time and a place that somehow had got a romantic uh, atmosphere about it. And part of it was the Hunter Thompson side of it. And the McGovern campaign was one of those things. You know, he carried one state. He didn't do very well, and yet there was a sort of a romance about it and there were McGovern campaign reunions almost up to the point where he died several years ago. So but I think... I don't think there was a... Um, you know, much has changed in some ways. Um, there, uh, on, in The Boys on the Bus, Timothy Krauss says, uh, Joe Kraft, he quotes Joe Kraft as saying, we have to pay attention to what middle America thinks. And I'm thinking, really? <laughs> it's the same today, right? One of my favorite moments in the general, uh, toward the end, um, uh, the then what came to be known in our slang as big feet, oh, yeah. columnists and the most senior network people, uh, didn't come out all that much during the general. In fact, one of the things I learned about uh, that part of the trade was how little those guys worked. <laughs> it was mostly um, <laughs> Were like you that. big-footed? Huh? Were you, you were no, never no. big-footed. Uh, no. uh, for some of us who had correspondent responsibilities in those days, the arrival of a Bigfoot was very much to be appreciated because the good ones would do your job for a day yeah. and file, and you could rest. Oh, um, for a so change. it was actually kind of nice. But I remember toward the end, um, uh, two of the most uh, hawkish of the Washington columnists, Joe also, mm. and Joe Kraft, who mm -hmm. was famous for his association with Kissinger at that time. And the McGovern people, God bless them, <laughs> were kind of tough 
uh, with that sort of thing. And I think they showed up thinking it was 1960 and they'd immediately be shown to the candidate's plane and ushered up to have a drink with the nominee, blah, blah, blah. It was Cleveland. And they told uh, uh, Kraft and Mr. Alsup that they would be riding on what we called the zoo plane. <laughs> which, oh. which, which, <laughs> you, <laughs> Connie can describe what the zoo plane was like. Well, we were the animals. Yeah. You know? We were the press, and um, there was an elite group that could fly on McGovern's plane, and they were often part of the, uh, the pool. Yeah. But, but then there was the rest of us, and many, <laughs> and we were the, you know, the scum. We were, we were animals, and uh, we were not to be respected. Acted like it, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we did. Well, look, I think, Carl, I think Carl was a Bigfoot. Yeah, I Well, I, I, well no, yeah. because the, the AP didn't have a Bigfoot problem. We had a couple people who were on the plane every week. The main plane really had about 40 journalists, had all the major papers won. <laughs> it was the backups and the... TV crews, and yes. when you were the third person with an organization, you ended mm -hmm. up in a zoo plane. And it wasn't only Kraft and Alsa, but there's a funny story that sort of shows, in some ways, things have not changed. One of the people who was exiled to the zoo plane was Bob Novak, yes. another conservative <laughs> yeah. columnist. Man and because he didn't, McGovern didn't him. like anything he wrote, and they put him on the zoo plane. <laughs> and if you think anything has changed, <laughs> I remind you of the story the other day about uh, the NPR reporter who was not allowed to travel with Mr. Pompeo. That's about <laughs> what happened then. Mm -hmm. I covered, I traveled with Spiro Agnew some in the early 70s, and the Washington Post and the Baltimore Sun weren't allowed to go with him because they would, their editorial policies were liberal. So that part has not changed. I will never forget McGovern's plane. We were, uh, it was called the Dakota Queen Two, because he. The first right. one was flew. this World War II plane. He, right. flew, he flew the MAX uh, bombing missions during World War II, which, um, but anyway, the Dakota Queen II pulling away from the tarmac in Cleveland and everybody waving bye-bye out the window at <laughs> Alsop and Joe Kraft. <laughs> <laughs> so it's... For, for a lot of younger people today, it must be just difficult for them to fathom what it was like for us to file articles when there were no computers, no internet, I mean, yeah. no email, Did you have no an, cell phones, not even fax machines. As we all had a technologically <laughs> advanced person covering a nominee in the general was the AP guy. Carl had more gizmos Right. Than anybody and, else. But it, was, it's, it shows what a different world it was. For example, I remember coming back from South Dakota after the summer where Senator McGovern and, and Senator Eagleton had had their famous meeting, and McGovern had now announced that, told everyone that in the case he was going to dump Eagleton. And we'll, we'll, we'll get, get to, to that, that story. <laughs> but uh, this is a story about technology. The AP reporter with me had written the story for morning papers. In those days, we wrote separate stories for morning and afternoon papers for the wires. And I said, you give me your copy. I'll find a phone. Because mm -hmm. we got to Mitchell South, there were, there were no filing centers. There were no cell phones. You, know, you had to find a pay phone somewhere where you could call your story in. And I said, you go with McGovern. I'll find a pay phone. And sometimes you, the Secret Service were guarding the payphones, and you couldn't get to them. But. What did you do for radio on a payphone? You had to uh, screw it. Unscrew yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the uh, receiver part, you had to be able to unscrew it and do, use your alligator clips to your uh, recorder for a little Sony re recorder. And uh, it was really hard to unscrew the payphones. <laughs> right, right. I mean... Really hard. I think I recall being asked over to, to your place. Yes. <laughs> Tom, can you gallantly? Try to, yeah. Yes, and you're, I can. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But Connie, you were well, with the film. You'd have to get that back to New York by seven. By yes. Well yes. before seven, mm -hmm. so you'd have to I, fought, You'd have to send your film back in the morning. Yes. We we no. I I have a notorious story. Maury, my husband, told me. You have to tell it because it just shows how aggressive and brutal you were 
Because, <laughs> you know, she I was mean, pretty aggressive. Because, <laughs> You know what I thought? Well, little old me, I wasn't yeah. that way, was yeah. I? And I was like, no. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just tell it to you quickly, because it's true. In those days, you had to fly your film to a location where it could be indeed developed and fed, or you know, literally flown back to New York. And so we would take these rickety uh, planes. Maury, I can't do this. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, my, I was always accused of trying to um, go around the big guy, whether it was the first string guy or the second string guy. And David Schumacher said he was supposed to show me around, show me the ropes and everything, and, and that I kept going around his back and calling New York and trying to sell stories directly for me to do. Uh, this time, my father had a heart attack, and, I, and so they said, you can come home. And I said, great. But since I'm flying to the location with the film, instead of having that guy do the report, why don't I do it on the TV <laughs> News? And they went, no, you are outrageous. And it went all through the bureau, and everybody was appalled. Whoops, you know? I wasn't supposed to, I, you know? Well, that still happens in TV. Yes. <laughs> you ever hear of Andrea Mitchell and Chuck Todd? <laughs> oh, it's cutthroat. <laughs> the, um, but I'm sorry. So, no. Yeah. I, I was just, the one thing that I, I can add to, kind. first of all, in the world of print, there were portable typewriters. Yes. Did you have a typewriter? I yeah. can't remember. Yeah, you who, had a, I had an you? Underwood that I think dated to the late 1930s. Ooh. Uh, and you had these little typewriters, uh, and you had to have paper. Uh, the tape recorder was just beginning to be miniaturized. Yes. So well, that you well, could hold it in your hand. Right. In 1968, for print people, tape recorders were ridiculous because they just got in the way of taking notes and whatever. Um, but. Uh, there was something different that is long gone because of the demise of monopolies in communication. But once you had a nominee, the candidate's plane always had a guy from this monster called AT&T, oh. whose job was to make sure that wherever you stopped, there was a big, there were several rows of telephones yeah. that worked. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we didn't have to fight for pay telephone yes. space like well, there was we a did Western, during the prime. And there was a Western, was a Western Union, Union guy. They unscrewed easily. And you could write your story. I, a couple of times, I wrote stories uh, in the middle of nowhere uh, on, I, I did it once on toilet paper um, <laughs> with a pen. And, um, and the Western Union guy would take it, and there would be operators waiting at the next stop awesome. who would do the telex transmission. Uh -huh. Very cool. And all of that is gone today. But I, I wanted to add something to Connie's point about life for her. About because what? She, life for you. Because she really, yeah, I mean, one of the things about them that perhaps is different from now is this was at the dawn of the let women in mm -hmm. age. Mm -hmm. And 1972 saw the arrival of three people. Um, one, an absolutely fabulous correspondent at CBS who was just marvelous, especially in New Hampshire and later at the convention, Michelle Clark, oh, uh, who we lost in a plane crash, crash. the following she was, uh, year. She, may, if yeah. I may, she was African American. Yeah. And when I was hired, the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission was putting great pressure on yeah. the network to hire women and, and minorities. and so. CBS News, which was in the Neanderthal years, and still kind of is, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, hired four women in one fell yeah. swoop. A black woman, Michelle yeah. Clark, me, a Chinese person, um, Leslie Stahl, a nice Jewish girl with blonde yeah. hair, and Sylvia Chase, a shiksa yeah. with blonde hair. Exactly. And they were like, we're done. Yeah, yeah. we're done. 
it looked like one of those tickets in the old uh, New York Democratic Party where you yeah. always had <laughs> yeah. you had one of everything. Exactly. But th there was one other woman, the third woman that year in 1972 who broke through, who had been a print reporter for the Hearst newspapers. And Cassie Mackin arrived on the scene also in the primaries in 1972, mm -hmm. lit up the set on a, NBC, at the convention at with NBC. 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 She's gone, sadly, uh -huh. in the early 80s. Cancer. Cancer. But mm -hmm. that's really all there was. <laughs> and these, I mean, yeah, Connie would go through a, a, a stone wall for a story. But then you <laughs> saw the story. And, and you realize, I mean, it was a generational thing at that time. The younger ones, we'd grown up with television. Mm -hmm. We were totally comfortable with it. Uh, most of us in personal life or political life had become comfortable with the women's movement that was gathering steam. It was the poor older guys <laughs> who, had, who had trouble, A, with women, and B, with television. Mm -hmm. um, and, but Tom... Tom married Susan Spencer, who is a force to be reckoned with <laughs> on her own. No, She's a television news uh, correspondent, yeah. long time yeah. at CBS News. But for a girl trying to think of a career or trying to wonder if there's some way to have a meaningful professional life, to see these three it, that long ago, early in 1972, <laughs> It was, it was the breakthrough, and it, it only got, I mean, it, it remains, it, sadly, very male in a lot of respects. It took a lot longer on the print <laughs> side. It was in yeah. 76, there were a few women covering the campaign. By 80, there were quite a few women covering the campaign mm -hmm. and things that changed. Yeah. Well, there sort was Elizabeth, of. on your on your bus, there was Elizabeth Drew was there from New Yorker sometimes. Yes, Mary sometimes, McCrory from the Mary Post. 72, was, no, 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 Elizabeth. No. Uh, Elizabeth uh, rarely came out mm -hmm. at that I, point. Mary, Mary is different. Was there? That's Mary McGorry, the great Mary yep. McGorry, was there. And you know, I, I I read her when she wrote for the Star, and later for the Post, of course. And I used to watch her because I always thought she was an, an incredible writer, as I'm sure everybody did. Um, and I was such a poor writer. I'd be sitting there in the middle of the night in the press room. The two of us would be the only ones there. Yeah. And I was just trying to come up with something mundane that I could just, so that I could convey what, what had happened. And she was toiling away in the middle of the night, writing and rewriting. And I'd watch her out of the corner of my eye, trying to give it, give it to me, you know, give, it, give me some vibes, please. <laughs> she was. Uh, she had already achieved that, that status. Uh -huh. But she was a character, too. Um, I remember the night of one of the primaries, and I'm going to take a wild guess and think it was Wisconsin. We were in a press room, and since Mary's not here to jump down my throat, uh, she might have had a couple at dinner before the, <laughs> before the returns uh, came in. And she she was a you know a Boston tough talking gal. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but she was very proper. fastidious about her appearance. Yes. And her hair was always done. Mm -hmm. And at any rate, there we were in this newsroom uh, as the return started to come in that night. And Mary, as I say, was a little off. But um, <laughs> she had a she? cigarette. And um, she was on the phone and gesticulating. And we, a bunch of us were watching this cigarette getting <laughs> getting closer and closer <laughs> to, to her hair. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it lit up. No. <laughs> and um, Mary liked young men to carry her bags. Oh, and yes. I, on this occasion, young men sprang forward and poured water on her. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? The, I can I tell yes. you that um, you know, be, being the only woman, um, th there was there was a lot of <coughs> game playing, right? And I, but I was used to that because it was an everyday affair. It was every day, you know. And you you see the 
Me Too movement today, you know. But back then, you know, it was just, uh, you know, it's a daily occurrence, and all of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, you can just, you know, you just deal with it. So one time... You going to make me tell the story, or are you going to tell oh, the story? Oh, <laughs> you, you, can you tell yours first? <laughs> Remember, there were all these things that these pioneers did that es helped establish the idea of women doing this. And one of the things was they were one of the, they re really were one of the boys, um, and especially this one. Um, and I remember one night during the general election, we were somewhere, and sometimes after we were all filed, we'd go have a couple before we turned in. And Connie handed, ha was pretty good about hanging out with us a little bit. Well, I, I mean, realized that's how you were getting your stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Tim Krause well, says in his yeah. book that I was always in bed in, in my room. No. You know? No. no. Well, I, I, I actually, well, he never said who I was in bed with. <laughs> no. He, he's, he said that when I realized that, you know, Carl was breaking stories right and left, you were breaking stories right and left, I said, how did this happen? I realized that if you go down to the bar and you, if you get whoever you can, like uh, on the campaign, a little shookered, then they might be able to tell you something. But anyway, go So ahead. there we are, uh, three or four of us, including Connie. And how many times have you seen this happen? Some, I don't know, ball-bearing salesman in a, you know, leisure suit, I guess we're... <laughs> started to hone in, obviously uh, and awkwardly, making passes in Connie's direction. And I was struck, first of all, by how calm and cool she was about it, almost as if she didn't really pay, uh, notice the guy. And he didn't understand, and he kept circling and coming back the way these bar flies do sometimes. And finally, I was just getting, he'd come back and was starting in, in again, and I was just starting to get up out of my chair to sort of shoo him away. When Connie gave him one of the most withering stares I have ever seen in my life and said a line that has stayed with me forever, <laughs> said Connie, look, you don't want to go to bed with me. You'd just be horny 20 minutes later. <laughs> you know, we were emailing From back that and moment forth. on, Connie was one of us. <laughs> when we were emailing back and forth, I said, well, he said he had a story. I have forgotten it, you know? I mean, I have no memory anymore. There's so a, I forgot it. But the, you know what? I had to develop a little repertoire because there were so many of these things coming out me every day. <laughs> One time, I have to tell you, um, Roger Mudd reminded me. When Roger was writing his book, he called me and he said, Jim Naughton and... Um, New York Times. Yep, ben. Jim Naughton of the New York Times and... Uh, let's see, another one. Uh, <coughs> oh, I know, Jules Woodcover. Uh, who was at that time working for um, LA. L LA, Times. Yeah, LA Times before he came to the Post. And he, they, um, I was at the, I think it was the Biltmore Hotel in Philadelphia on the phone, you know, on a payphone, the kind that, the old fashioned payphone with the accordion glass door and a big black uh, payphone and a seat. And so I was sitting there. I was actually talking to somebody who I was, had been dating. And, and they, they came up and pressed their noses against the harassing me, you know. And I thought they were sexually harassing me. And I just got, oh. And so they pushed their way in. And since I was sitting here, I, I could see their belt buckles. You know, they were at that height. So to get rid of them, I put my fire and I pulled their flies down. <laughs> <laughs> and Roger said to me, did you do that? And I went, mm, I think so. <laughs> 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 so, 
So well, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> that's a hard one to follow. <laughs> so, uh, did you feel you you ha you had a lot of access to McGovern? I'm I'm just curious about how, and yeah. and when all the journalists when they were covering a campaign, whether well, they would get close to the candidate enough so that they felt. Uh, almost possessive or something. I, uh, Krauss writes about after after Muskie tanked in the polls, seeing uh, a group of his journalists had just knocked down five rounds of whiskey because they were their their guy was out. The um, that was one of the things that was most different, I think, about 1972 Versailles is the access. First of all, we're on the same plane with the candidate and with the staff. And there are really no barriers there. You could go up and talk to McGovern, and you could do things like that. And I remember being in New Hampshire in early January of 1972, and I wanted to do a story about McGovern. I rode around with him in a car, and I think the only other person in the car was the driver. I don't think there was a little uh, press aide there. And I don't know if you want me to tell the, the story about the... Uh, thousand percent. Oh, <laughs> you must. One of the reasons that... <laughs> yeah, it was so good. I wrote the story that prompted um, McGovern to say he was a thousand percent behind Eagleton. And what happened was that McGovern and Eagleton had had a press conference where they announced that Eagleton had had um, treatment for depression, um, including electric shock treatment. And after that story, you sort of, when with the wires, you're going to think, what's the next cycle? What's the follow-up? And I saw Tom Otnett of the Post-Dispatch go into McGovern's cabin, and I said, hmm, he's got an interview with McGovern. I've got to figure out how to get an interview. I found out somehow that he was playing tennis. He was at an hour <laughs> tennis lesson. And so I went over to the tennis court where he was and asked if, when he was finished, I could ride up with him to his cabin and talk to him. And he said, sure. Now, you couldn't get within 10 miles of a candidate today. You'd, in most cases, you don't fly on the same plane with them. You don't do anything. So I went back to the press room. We had our, we didn't have one of those little tape recorders yet. The AP couldn't afford it. We had one of these big things, and we had one for the two of us. And I got it from my colleague, not telling him why I wanted it, because I didn't want to tell anyone what I might have. And I interviewed McGovern. And in the course of the interview, he, I asked him, what do you think the public reaction to Eagleton's announcement will be? And, he had been very supportive of Eagleton. When I asked that question, he said, well, he said, we'll have to wait and see. The lead. <laughs> McGovern is still supporting Eagleton, but he says, we'll have to wait and see how uh -oh. the public reacts. OK, Where that's a simple wire service lead, totally innocuous. I file it. Now, you have to understand about communications in those days. Half the McGovern staff is in South Dakota. Half is in Washington. They barely have phone communication back and forth. They don't have a wire. They don't have an internet. They have no way to see my story for hours and hours and hours. And when they see my story, they go crazy and say, oh, he's pulling back from Eagleton. We have to do something about it. And they have a hurry up meeting. And McGovern says, well, I'll deny it. And um, the press secretary said, no, I don't think you could do that. And of course, I had it on tape. And so his solution was to put up a statement saying, in response to the AP story, I'm a thousand percent behind Eagleton. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the statement was put on the wall, wall at the of, press room at the press room of the Lakota Lodge of the high home the, of the high of home Western, <laughs> best Western. And the person who did it is it's sitting here. in the third row. She <laughs> had oh peaches. <laughs> 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 she had she had red hair then. <laughs> There's some of it still. Carol did, Friedenberg, did, who did, went on to join our racket after the election and had yes. a great life. As but a that was her moment in history, and she pulled um, but, it off beautifully. But, but and what? here's this more serious point, I think. Timmy in the book. Yeah. Did he get something there, wrong? No, he got something right. And we all got it wrong. The, the, Who wrote? Timmy's thesis uh -huh. in this book is that the established way of covering politics was full of it. Was what? Uh, full of it. Uh -huh. 
that it created a two-dimensional linear reality that unreality, easily manipulated by politicians. On the Eagleton-McGovern thing, his point was that overall we had blown the story because we failed it to transmit how manipulative, I loved Eagleton, but how manipulative Eagleton, Eagleton was, was in trying to stay on the ticket, mm -hmm. and then how skillfully manipulative McGovern was in trying to grease the skids for getting rid of him without having a dramatic press conference saying, I'm getting rid of the guy. Mm -hmm. um, you had this confusion about, but Timmy's point was that all of this was farce and not genuine drama. And that is the larger point that he was trying to make in the book. Mm. Um, and I think it, that's one reason it is still studied today because there's something wrong still with mm -hmm. two-dimensional journalism. Mm -hmm. And in many respects, the hero of this book, not with stories about drugs and booze and sex, though there are a few of those, <laughs> is Hunter Thompson, who could make the, a campaign more real by going off to Pluto and back with these wild, I mean, the, the, our favorite one, remember in New Hampshire, that he had discovered that the reason Mag Muskie was a lousy candidate, was boring as hell, stiff as a board, um, et cetera, was that somebody had smuggled up to New England this drug from Brazil, and he even had a name for it, mm -hmm. Ibogaine. And it made you boring. I boring. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever. And then he would go on to describe an actual appearance by Muskie, which could be like this. The real guy was very funny, very profane, worried about his stature, but a very obviously an interesting man. But this thing that was campaigning was was just not. Anyway, Hunter's descriptions of Muskie were more real than ours. Mm -hmm. And that's <coughs> Tim's message. Right. But and so and also, I, but also. He made a wholesale, <laughs> you know, <laughs> decision about everyone. I don't think it's true with every single reporter. Oh, no. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Oh, I, I couldn't agree were, more. You yeah. Know, oh, you, yeah. If you look at David Broder, uh, you know, oh, uh oh. Well, Tim was trying, one of the th but th you have to weigh in in a second, but one of the questions Tim is wrestling with in this one, and it would come up repeatedly in campaigns all later, all the way to today, is how could the whole institution have been dead wrong about mm. Ed Muskie? Not about whether he was a good guy or a bad guy, but just what the situation was. Well, From it, early they also, the they also early saw that he had a real temper. The until practically the eve of the New yeah, Hampshire but, primary, there was this massive structure known as the Tom, Muskie campaign. It, it dominated all the coverage. Everybody was wrong said, about well, Hillary too. We were well, wrong that's about my point. Hillary. That's yeah, my point. It's this is alive the, and well today. We were just beginning to have a debate. 1972, among ourselves, usually in bar rooms, about whether our coverage was about candidacies and what they were about. Or the horse race. Or, or here it came. Uh -huh. that, if the first time you hear that term yeah. is in 1972. In our daily stories, yours as well as mine, you, if the can, a nominee went somewhere and said something, that was the story. And what they usually did was they had one new paragraph in yes. their standard speech, right. and that gave you your lead. Something to write about. Because and you, you could recite the, the speech right. with him, right. um, but we could hear one new part. So well, we it got to the point the press would, corps, press would, corps would sit there mouthing the speech absolutely. as the candidate was uh -huh. giving it. One of uh, McGovern's traveling gurus in 1972 was a guy who had been central to presidential politics since 1960. Fred Dutton uh, oh, Fred. was his name. Yeah. 
later went on to become, believe it or not, the Washington operator for the government of Saudi Arabia and made <laughs> buckets of money. Boy, did he get <laughs> rich. <laughs> but, but he was marvelous at his craft. And he, one thing he always had his, the candidates he was advising do is personalize something about the stump speech so at least everybody could have a laugh and whatever. And there's one example <laughs> that involves you and me. Um, uh, McGovern uh, would have lines in his stump speech about uh, uh, classic liberal that he was about the need for tax reform. Well, and when, and when the line was about what? Tax every reform. A, a, every day, the big rich businessman can deduct the price of his three, three martini, martini lunch, lunch. <laughs> and the line in the speech would be and the poor working guy can't deduct the Cost price of his well bologna sandwich. That's right. By <laughs> what he would do just to lighten things up a little bit. He'd said, and, the, and a poor working stiff like Carl Lubsdorf or Tom can't, Oliphant can't deduct, can't. The, can't deduct <laughs> the cost of his peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And when he, he did it in Erie, Pennsylvania, yeah. I was thinking, why did he do this? And I realized, and it gets back to access, I was talking to McGovern on the plane just before we got yeah. off. So I was probably. Yeah. Is slightly in his mind. And That's Fred Dutton. By then, he was lo also he was losing the mm -hmm. election, and he was sort of that trying to have a little fun because you know this was not going to end well. That was <laughs> Fred Dutton. He had, he had a great one for Bob Kennedy too, who always closed his speech with the famous quote from George Bernard Shaw. You know, some people see things as they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. Um, and several times. Robert Kennedy would say into the microphone. And so, as George Bernard Shaw said, let's all get to the press buses. <laughs> <laughs> and the mood would lighten. Access was very different. Um, and meanwhile, and the contrast was so profound because Nixon was invisible, absolutely <laughs> invisible. He was nowhere to be found. It finally became a story at the end of the campaign. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and I think all of us felt that uh, no one was pressing him from that side to come out of the bunker and meet with the press. He just would not. And he would engage. You know, just before 72, one of the boys on the bus, who at the time was representing the Gannett newspaper chain and would later be far more famous deservedly for that was Jack Germond. Mm. And Germond always believed... He wasn't believed, at the Baltimore Sun at the No, time. it hadn't happened. It was, no, uh, he was still uh, at Gannett. Technically, it was Albany, I think. But Gannett was the chain at, at that time. It was a real chain and a serious one. But, but things like <laughs> USA Today hadn't happened yet, and they did the column at the Washington Star <laughs> first in 77. But anyway, Jack had the idea after the 60s that we needed, the people who did politics regularly ha needed to have regular access to the people who were running just to talk and get to know each other. And so he organized something which one of us, I can't remember. Anyway, it was called Political Writers for a Democratic Society. <laughs> and there were maybe seven or eight of us. And we would have supper at somebody's apartment or house. And the candidate and one aide only would come. And it, would be, it wouldn't be off the record. It would be on what they call around here deep background meaning that you couldn't attribute anything, you couldn't even allude to your having talked to the fellow, you couldn't use a quote, you could say it's under, you know, you, there are ways you could say it, but you couldn't say it directly, and of course, no pictures. <laughs> and no broadcast and no, no wires, because well, we that, didn't do deep background. As, as so, time, well, so we, we were you, you famously, didn't you ask Gingrich once on camera? Oh, yeah. To, <laughs> <laughs> Just between you and me? Yeah. Right. <laughs> my, my wife had some dumb congressman up in upstate New York 
who everybody knew was thinking of endorsing Ted Kennedy for, for president. And this guy was batting the tennis ball back and forth with a bunch of us one day. And my wife finally said, well, off the, re the cameras are running. Yeah. Off the record, Congressman, are you going to endorse Kennedy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and the lights are on, yeah. the cameras are rolling, and they got a microphone on. I mean, duh. <laughs> right? But these things were incredibly useful. I mean, I, I was well, very young then. I'm very old now. But I felt like I knew these people. Uh, and in a pinch, you could have a candid conversation. Mm -hmm. um, in a but do you think you, you guys were more irreverent then? I mean, he, he quotes you at one point when Gordon Weil comes out to give a talk to the bus on McGovern's new economic plans that he's just released, and he starts talking, <laughs> and he quotes you as saying, boy, I've heard a lot of bullshit before, but this takes the cake. I mean, would you was me, what, it kept going. We eventually, in effect, threw Gordon off the bus <laughs> and just gave up. Um, there was another moment which <laughs> tested all of us uh, uh, and was very illustrative of what was happening then, and you can compare it to now. McGovern uh, was an early proponent of what's been called in economics the demogram. You know, every citizen has a certain account they start out uh -huh. in life with. Um, $1,000 a thousand dollars a person? And well, of how course, is that different from? It's, it's more common today. It's, uh, Yang, Yang does, yeah. it, Yang does it now. Nixon had a version of it in 1969, there believe it or not. But, um, uh, but this thing came out, and it was all new. It was called liberal at the time. It wasn't clear how much it would cost. Or how. Anyway, about a month ensued of almost round-the-clock, ruthless examination of this mm -hmm. proposal. Well, of all because of, they didn't know how much it was. <laughs> well, well, that's right. It and reflected the division. And McGovern couldn't explain it either. Nobody he had ever gone into an it. issue like this with a candidate that deeply. And after the election, I wish I could remember which journalism school did it, there was more ink spilled exposing the deficiencies of McGovern's economic proposal mm -hmm. than had been expended on Watergate to that time. Oh, my you goodness. Know what was different, Ed, was the fact that all this interchange with the press got into Tim's book, and that, of course, made it very... But it, there was no internet. There was, there, it wasn't written about. You could say things off the record and talk to candidates off the record, and it wouldn't be quoted. You can't... Say, if a reporter today turns to another reporter in the White House press room, assuming they have a press room still, <laughs> and says something, it's likely to be on the internet two minutes later, right, and he's right. going to have to explain <laughs> it to his editor. And, and I, would, I would also say that, that the, the, the Eastern liberal establishment press was alive and well, as it probably is today. And the, all, I would guess that all, most all of the reporters did vote for McGovern, they, they uh, probably did not vote for Nixon. And yet, I think all of us believed so strongly that if, if we happen to be, um, as an individual citizen, someone who might want to vote for that person, we would bend over backwards to be critical. And in my, I thought that every reporter was, went overboard being critical of McGovern just because they did not want to be accused of soft peddling him or his message. Do you? Yes. After the convention. That? That's still Tell happening me today. Exactly. It happened with the Times' coverage of Hillary Clinton in, 19, in 2016, mm -hmm. and it's happening with the Times' coverage of Biden today. You look at the Times, every day there's a story about something Biden is doing wrong. I assume he's going to finish eighth in Iowa, <laughs> from what I've read in the Times. And what were you going to say? No, I, uh, I was going to pick up on Connie, what Connie was saying and ask her something, and that is when, when you're out there, when you were out there mm -hmm. um, with the microphone, how did you know what to ask? I mean, you were not just sticking the microphone in people's faces. 
you were one of these people who prompted people like McGovern to say something, oh. to get some fresh sound or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it required that you be completely up to speed first thing in the morning. So when he came out of the hotel to get in his car in the motorcade, if you had a newsy question, you were likely to get a newsy answer. And that's what you did, right? Yes. <laughs> but, uh, well, thank you for but, knowing that. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the way it was done then, um, is that everybody didn't travel, or on the ground especially, in mm -hmm. one giant scrum of 50 to 100 people, uh, particularly in general elections after the conventions. Reporters are divided up into shifts, morning, afternoon, and evening, mm -hmm. usually, and seven or eight of them will represent all their colleagues mm -hmm. uh, at, at stuff where they can't fit everybody in, and they're called pool reporters. Um, and so I would maybe have that duty every other day or something, but you had it 24 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> well, told you the so so wires. We're, we're yeah, about so out of time. You. Okay. We're about out of time. The audience okay. is gonna have a couple questions. I wanna ask you, Carl, uh, he, he, uh, Tim talks about <coughs> the folly of trying to cover a campaign from 30,000 feet. And still a lot of the reporters got it wrong about the McGovern campaign because you said, you told me you were going around and seeing large crowds and enthusiastic well, crowds. there were no polls. This is one thing. Polling was really in its infancy. There At were one point, McGovern polls. was 20 points up in the field poll. But in California, yeah. Fornia, yeah. but we thought he was probably that. losing but he had these enormous crowds everywhere. And I got off the plane about a week out to go back to AP headquarters to do you know, main story. And I was stunned to discover that no one thought he was gonna carry anything. And so you, didn't, you did not really have the same information that everyone has today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, now, I would say today, <laughs> so everything is so poll driven, that's another story. But right. Mm -hmm. So um, one, I have one last quick question before we go to the audience. Did you think he was um, going to get blown up? One, one quick question. You did. What was the best? <laughs> what was the best prank? Because there were some pranks in the bus. Uh, well, yes. Um, God. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe you can't tell. One of the things that was different about 1972 was you started to get something that is a common feature of the presidential campaign scene today, and that's the arrival of somebody from Vanity Fair or Gentleman's Quarterly or Esquire, you know, <laughs> in those is some kind of magazine big shot. Uh, Sometimes they come out now to write about the press. I noticed there was a big story in, in the style section this morning of the Washington Post about who's screwing whom <laughs> <laughs> out in Iowa. I didn't know they did that. <laughs> they weren't doing that in 1972. But Tom, can I just quickly ask you, was, wasn't there this woman who was a Nixon spy? Lucy Ann oh, Goldberg. Lucy, Lucy Ann With the Goldberg. cigarette holder. That Lu was, yes. Uh, Lucy Ann Goldberg, who was a Nixon spy and was on the zoo plane. Yes. And later turned, uh -huh. reappeared uh, some years later as a friend of, a confidant Linda of Jeff. Monica Lewinsky <laughs> and helped break that story. That's and her son is still a columnist, I believe. Yeah. She, she was there every day. We thought she was writing a book. Uh -huh. And at events, you would see her standing. She had a cigarette holder <laughs> and, and, and a drink, more often than not. And <laughs> she talked into a tape recorder. Uh, supposedly, she said she was doing her a book, and she would mumble these uh, ridiculously detailed things into it. There are 500 people here. <laughs> McGovern looks tired, <laughs> ridiculous things. Uh -huh. so and it turned out this was going to Haldeman's office every night. Hmm. And it didn't come out until the, the hearings the next year. Anyway, one of these. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Am I going to tell it? OK, go ahead. I told the one on you already. I'm not, well, so what? Um, <laughs> one of these fancy magazine reporters showed up. 
and dressed beautifully. Uh, Sacks, at least, if not a designer. <laughs> and, and a handbag that had to have cost four figures. I just could not take my eye off the handbag. <laughs> and the, the campaign was going to San Francisco that day. And by the time we got there, we were pretty well, pretty lubricated and not particularly pleased with this big shot arrival. And she was sitting toward the front of the bus. The hardcore tended to sit in the back. And she put this, I, I don't know, purses, whatever it was, a spectacular thing in the aisle. Oh. Of the bus. Well, in those days, uh, campaign buses, press buses, did not come equipped with restrooms. Right. And one of our number had an emergency as we were driving in from the <laughs> airport. I won't say who. And he just couldn't wait any longer. And in the back, on the back seat, um, he tried to use a beer can and, <laughs> and mostly failed. <laughs> and this little rivulet. This is San Francisco, right? So you got hills and all the rest of it. Yeah. This, do you remember this story, Carol? <laughs> anyway, this rivulet began to make its way down the aisle oh, no. <laughs> of the bus toward, toward the purse. And pretty soon the entire bus is cheering every molecule <laughs> of this. And then there was this huge, Huge cheer when it, when it hit home. <laughs> kind of like, welcome to presidential politics, <laughs> Miss Big Shot. <laughs> this is a very, very hard thing it's to break true. into. Was it? I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. Remember, oh. ask a question, keep it succinct, don't make a campaign speech. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, uh, Craig Sherman, uh, formerly with UPI at the Trenton Bureau. Back in the days when this book was written, uh, the, the three of you, colleagues like Walter Mears, David Broder, Johnny Apple, were sort of gatekeepers who I think sort of got to decide in a way who ran for president if you thought they were a serious contender or not. In our last couple of administrations, we had a president who only had two years' experience as, as senator. Since then, we've had a president who had no political experience whatsoever. In, in the days of the boys on the bus, would either of those have been taken seriously, and would they have gotten enough coverage to get Ooh. elected? Obama and, and Trump. Mm -hmm. not, a, not a problem. Um, remember that when McGovern ran, when 1972 started to happen, for all of this way over the top concentration on Muskie, everybody covering that campaign had been through the earthquake of 1968, when the same thing had happened also in New Hampshire with Gene McCarthy. Um, and I can tell you, as somebody who went through it, um, there was never, the, the one thing that I thought was unfortunate looking back is that there was not much attention paid to a, what really was a historical change, and that was the candidacy of Shirley Chisholm. Mm. Um, I don't think any of us understood uh, what a big deal that was. Well, but remember how big this, the field was in 1972. There was one debate in New Hampshire where they had to five, use... Five candidates. No, 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 no. This is, there were, tw they had to use two tables. They had them stacked up on top of each other somehow at some dinner. Remember oh, Sam Yorty of Los Angeles, this crazy guy who threw the rat what? on the on the table who said there's not enough being done about hunger. Some guy named Ed Cole, I remember. Still his alive. Name. He's still alive. Uh, his big cause was public access to beaches. But anyway, he's running for president. Wilbur Mills oh, yeah. uh, was running. Anyway, they, they had them stacked up like this, and it was a it, uh, New Hampshire, but Muskie dominated so much 
But there's a, before I shut up, there's a message behind your question, though, that I, I'm not sure I accept. One thing I learned from 1972 is the, the impact of what we do is almost zero. Um, people have their own ways of figuring out what the hell is going on. We play a role, but I think uh, most of us tend to exaggerate it. And uh, it's true, people don't get mentioned who should. May, I'm sure everybody who's dropped out of the Democratic race so far would feel in some way slighted. But the truth is it's a fair fight. But the, the mistake you can make is in thinking that your impact is colossal. We really don't matter at all. Well, the, there's, there's a big change. There's a, a new paradigm now um, in print, television, the way I knew it, television network news, it's actually lacks relevance in many ways today because of the internet. So, you know, information zips through the cloud and uh, but the general and it's asked not about accurate Trump. information. Asked and that's about Trump. The problem. All, a lot of the things that were, they were written, there were written stories about all the crooked things he'd done and all the stuff he did, and his people didn't care, and they still don't care. And it didn't matter that everyone wrote about it, and didn't matter it was all true. And Nixon was an early uh, believer in that, uh, and his operation was the first one, first one to be structured that way. They'd learned some of it with television in 68, but in terms of content and scheduling, they had it down pat, but Reagan did it in 84. Um, and, but in contests for nominations, uh, I think the experience shows it's a, it's a free for all, it's a fair fight, front runner doesn't mean anything. That word well, finally got its comeuppance in our year. Well, and Muskie, when Muskie was the front runner, poor McGovern had, had announced a year earlier he was going all around the country. No one was paying any attention to him. It was, it was finally about six months in, there was a story in the New York Times saying McGovern's been a candidate for six months, he's not going anywhere. And for some reason, he called me up. I don't know why, <laughs> maybe just because I'd been covering him. So what should he do about this? And you know, I, I'm a straight reporter. It's not my job to tell him what to do. And I said the first thing that came into my head, I said, it's very simple, Senator. All you have to do is win the New Hampshire primary. And he didn't win the New Hampshire he primary, <laughs> but he did well enough. And the press said he won, so. But the, w the showing actually marked another moment yeah. where 1972 is yeah. a turning point. Up until that point, there had always been a lot of attention paid to the following word, expectations. Um, and when you had a front runner, um, there would be a game in the 60s and into 72, well, how much does he have to win by? What's the expectation? And every night in a campaign setting, um, I credit Jules Whitcover with coming up, a bunch of us would write a song, a mocking song, uh, about some event or theme uh, in the campaign. And in New Hampshire, the expectations one was done to the tune of Rock of Ages. <laughs> And if I remember the lyric, it's David Broder, write for me. <laughs> Tell me what is victory. <laughs> <laughs> and the number that the Muskie people fastened on was 55%. 50, 50. 55. Mary, the famous <laughs> quote is Marie Currier. I know it was Marie Currier. <laughs> and if he doesn't get 55, she said, I'll eat my hat. What was it, 47, I seven. think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that kid. And McGovern won you know, with 36%. Uh, now, there's still people who haven't learned, but that was the first moment to just dump all over. But you the know, there are stories, there's stories mm -hmm. being written today about the expectations next Monday in Iowa. I know. Uh, but you know, before I forget, Tim Krause said of Nixon, no president had ever worked so lovingly or painstakingly <laughs> to emasculate reporters. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know? <laughs> there, 
Uh, it, Trump knows where he got it from. Uh, yeah. I he probably think so. doesn't, actually. Uh, I mean, oh my goodness. Let's see if we get a word in edgewise here from West Pip. Oh, no. Hi, Will. Hi. Uh, How are you, Will? Uh, alas, you will not find my name in Tim Krause's uh, Boys in the Bus. You should be. But I did have one small measure of uh, advantage, and that was that I had covered McGovern in South Dakota. Uh, fresh out of Iowa, I was soon found myself in South Dakota, Pierre and Sioux Falls. And they kept mentioning about this young, rising young Democratic uh, politician, a Democrat in South Dakota, named George McGovern. I had never heard of George McGovern. And he was a debate coach at Dakota Wesleyan, as you know. And he was about to run for the House against Joe Foss, the World War II flying uh, ace. AFL commissioner. And he won it. And he won it, too. And so uh, I, that was a small advantage that, uh, that I had. Uh, Tim Krause said to me later, he said, uh, sometime we'll have to talk about what it was like to cover McGovern uh, in the early days. Well, we never had that talk, <laughs> alas. Uh, one, one way that McGovern did campaign then, the UP Bureau in Sioux Falls is on the fifth floor of a rundown office building, the syndicate building. The elevators didn't start running until something like 8 o'clock, and I had to file the weather at 7. And every morning during the campaign, many mornings during the campaign, George McGovern would mount those five floors without an elevator and stop by with a handout that he probably had written and typed himself before going off to, uh, uh, to a sales <coughs> meeting or whatever. But the man struck me because I had never heard anybody who was quite so articulate or, uh, or moving. You know, Wes, uh, the uh, modern, de it was illegal to be a Democrat in South Dakota when, when McGovern started in the uh, early 50s mm -hmm. as a college guard. And he drove himself around in a beat-up station wagon and built that party all by himself. Mm. Yo. <laughs> um, I'm going to test Gill's motor skills here by making a brief statement and having my question be whether you come along for the ride or if I'm bar barking up the wrong tree. Um, we heard a lot about the importance of staying lubricated as, as a reporter. It strikes me it'd be an interesting history of journalism to look at the amount of money journalists are willing and able to pay for what they drink and what kind of establishments <laughs> they, drink, they drink in. And so I wonder, you know, going from a time when, when somebody dressing in very expensive attire on a bus would be looked down upon to a time now where a lot of people are taking out immense debt in graduate school to go into journalism and, and are, I think, probably drink, you know, having different kinds of drinks at different kinds of bars. I wonder if, 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 if anybody has thoughts on kind of the challenge for journalists today to connect with readers and viewers when maybe there's a bigger gap between the way they're living their lives than there was in the 70s. <laughs> well, actually, the McGovern campaign did provide uh, liquor, didn't they? United the Airlines. Room? Yeah, with charters. It was, yeah. before, it was before deregulation. Mm -hmm. So everybody wanted to keep their monopoly. And that World meant Airlines that, and, and American Airlines the ran the two charters. Western Union, the phone company, uh -huh. and and um, uh, my God, they, first thing in the morning. Mm. So it was, uh, I think it was provided, no? Oh, I'm sure it was on the plane, sure it was. Yeah. Uh, it's always been true on charters, it was true on White House charters, there was always plenty to drink. The difference is today, reporters don't drink as much. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and we, you uh, noticed it during the campaign over the years when it sort of switched from Bloody Marys in the morning to mineral water. Mm -hmm. And um, you got to the mid 80s or the early 90s, and there were only a, two or three, you know, the older guys were still <coughs> drinking, and it, all the new breed that had come along were not. Um, I they have to work the, harder, too. So. One of the a line I used to use, it was expected that you always dove at the table and picked up checks. You know, I, I was trained in expense living. Don't leave a check on the table, pick it up. 
And so I would reach in and somebody would object and say, no, I'll get some of that. I said, no, it's all right. It's only money and it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, uh, DJ Caulfield, member of the press club. Lester Markle, a New York Times editor, said several years ago as gonzo journalism was first evolving, what you see is news. What you know is background. What you feel is opinion. With increasing frequency, we see reporters on CNN, MSNBC, or Fox offering opinions 24-7. Is this moving journalism forward? I well, as the, as the husband of a distinguished journalist, Susan <laughs> Page, who often appears on television, um, I think actually it's something of a problem. There, you know, there are many people, there are some people, I would say, and Susan is certainly one of them, who confine themselves to analysis and explanation of what they see as coming. And there are many others who are expressing points of view. And um, I'm amazed to see a reporter from the Associated Press, where I once worked, expressing opinions on Morning Joe morning after morning. But it seems like the news organizations like the prominence that their people have. Prominence on TV leads to clicks on the website, and clicks on the website means someone's paying attention. Um, and the line has gotten very, very blurred, and I think it's not good. Jonathan Salant, past president of the press club, and uh, Carol is the brother-in-law. Uh, Carl, something you said. Lucky you. Uh, you talked about the, the opinion of uh, that you seem to bend over backwards not to favor McGovern. But this was the first campaign after the White House used its platform to attack the press, nattering nabobs of negativism, for example. Do you think that influenced uh, your coverage? And you think even today, knowing the organizations out there that are going after the press, uh, that that's why the New York Times is going after Joe Biden, as you said, or Hillary Clinton. You think that's influencing coverage even now? Boy, there are a lot of premises there. Yeah. You know, the, the question is, Connie has more perspective, I think, than either of us. Well, um, well, what's it like? What's your sense? Um, you know, because I, I lost you a little bit there. Yeah. Um, we, did we bend over backward? I mean, we're, it's two years into the Agnew attack when we all meet up right. out there. No, I, I think, don't think it had any effect, yeah. frankly. No, I, honestly, I think we're we're just normal people, mm -hmm. and I think when you when you're a normal reporter, you want to be. We all want to be fair, and if we have a personal bias in one direction or another direction, I think we try very hard to push the, our personal bias out of the way and be fair. Mm -hmm. So consequently, if, if we were at that time mm, appalled with what Spiro Agnew said, I think we tried very hard just to be objective. And we're all, uh, uh, we're, we, we are all, uh, products of our own experience. So we can't help being slightly subjective, um, but we try not to be. Plus, you know, there's a repertorial fact that's worth putting on the table here. I didn't know many Nixon or Agnew people who really believed all that malarkey. It was a way of doing politics that they discovered could work. And there were times when it was almost a game. I mean, after that first speech, what, Bill Sapphire and Buchanan are still Bill from the grave and Pat uh, still, uh, still arguing about who wrote it, the <laughs> nattering nabobs of negativism. But there, there'd be games played yeah. at night with them to come up with other uh, alliterative uh, phrases, some of them not printable, <laughs> and they all indulged in this, and it transmitted to me a feeling that this is more of a game than it is something serious. Even today, it just strikes me as otherworldly. But what I was talking about with the Times is 
I think that is bending over backwards to show that in the Times' case, they're not for the Democrats and for, for against Trump. And so you do it by being as tough as possible on the other side. And um, I think they sometimes carry it to an extreme, frankly. Hi, uh, Dr. Katshar with the Water Citizen Media. And we, uh, you, know, you mentioned that you don't, people don't have the direct access that they used to have. They can't just go to the tennis club and keep <coughs> and have direct conversations. But at least the political journalists are on the campaign trail with the candidates. And it seems like now we've got this, this intermediary layer of the curators. And the people are getting the news not from the people who are in direct contact with the candidates, but through whether it's a blog or whether it's a, you know, an article or something, that they're compiling the stories and, and become that, that intermediary. Does that, does that seem to? Who are the intermediaries? Um, whether it's bloggers, whether it's uh, someone at the newsroom who's sort of pulling in the information from the people who are out on the front lines. We're not getting the stories directly from the people who are on the front lines following the campaign. I mean, we. Do you study all this? Well, as we do online media. Because I have, I'll yeah. tell you, as a consumer, yeah. here's what I'd like. Take a 24-hour period and somehow get it all. Stream some events. If one of these, a handful of these blogs, um, what's the thing that has the circle with the line in it, and then you can only write 150 words or something? Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> Do people read that stuff? Well, anyway. Um, yes. Yeah. Really? Well, but. Get it all. Give me, a give me a day in the life of 20th, 21st century media and tell me what it's like. And if you learned anything, if it was all just a bunch of jibber jabber and then here's a picture of my lunch or something. Um, um, uh, because it's so diffuse now, I can't learn very much no, from the I coverage. Can well, you? I, no. no, I can't I either. Can't find the truth. Yeah. I'm having such a hard time trying to find out yeah. what is accurate, what is true. Um, I've taken to streaming events really, uh, or, or getting video so you can watch a candidate's event from just to find out what they're saying and what's going on there. Yeah. The, the horse race, which was what, three paragraphs in a daily story right. in 72, is now the story. and. Believe me, it still reads to me like 90% baloney um, and doesn't have anything to do with educating me about anything going on in the country or whatever. It's just if you get this much in Iowa, can you translate it to New Hampshire and then to Nevada? And, and I, I want to say, well, shut up. Um, <laughs> well, and, and it's all built around poles, which are mostly built on sand. Every pole that you have seen from New Hampshire of uh, Nevada, um, uh, South Carolina, and nationally will be worthless next Tuesday after right. Iowa votes. But you know Everything what? that's word that's been written about them and what was happening in those states will change. I don't want to wholesale um, criticize journalism today either because I think some, such incredible investigative journalism is being done today. I mean, phenomenal, um, and I think, and that it runs across the board in print, in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, but also some of the broadcast networks are doing great investigative journalism. So I don't want to dump on the media in, in a wholesale way, because I think a lot of people do. What I do have a problem with are the um, uh, social media and, um, misinformation that gets disseminated very quickly with nobody checking it. I mean, the, the old fashioned way was we had editors and producers and so many layers of people <coughs> breathing down our throats, making sure that what we reported was accurate. And uh, I mean, I was deathly afraid of being fired 
because I didn't want, right. I mean, it was really a question of whether or not I've got this right. And if I didn't have it right, I knew my head would be on the chopping block. But today, it's not because people are not dedicated or whatever, but there are certain outlets that allow um, into mind, out of mouth, or into mind, on the paper, and disseminated instantly. Yeah. And that's where I have a problem. I cannot ferret out the truth. Yeah. Um, Too much. So I have to read all kinds of things to sort of come to my own conclusions as to what might yeah. be the truth. And probably the best is actually to watch it, whatever yeah. it is, whatever is going on, you watch it yourself, and you come to your own conclusion. Yeah, in the Democratic side, I'd say 90% of what I know about the race comes from watching each of them. I try to do, an, a, even now in retirement, a couple of events a day, beginning to end, to just have a sense of what they're like that I used to get from yeah. my buddy here. But I think one thing is there is, in a way, too much coverage. Everything is written and everything is breathless, and no one is stepping back and saying, This is important and this isn't important. And you read, and the Post has done a wonderful job in some ways. They've got a terrific bunch of, they've hired every reporter practically in the Western world who doesn't work for the Times. God knows what's going to happen to them after the election. But in any case, <laughs> there's so many stories about so many people that I, I don't know where the truth lies. I was going to uh, say we should have a sum up after the last question here, but that was a beautiful sum up. So let's just go to the last question. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the last question. Okay, well, I guess it's coming from uh, someone who's uh, uh, worked both sides of the bus. And uh, my name is Bill Outlaw. I used to uh, work as a reporter down in South Carolina. I was on the bus for the Jimmy Carter campaign, and traveling around then. Later worked for the Associated Press in the Washington Times. I then worked the other side of the bus for a long shot candidate named uh, Governor Pete DuPont in Delaware. Uh, Carl and Tom, I think I dealt with you guys some on that. So it wasn't very successful, I guess. But <laughs> anyway, my question is, um, uh, in today's world, uh, with the um, focus and the use of the term fake news, and uh, first, uh, how do you think the media are dealing with that and what would you advise the media uh, to do to deal with that? I think we have to do our job, frankly. Mm -hmm. And the, there are people in the journalism world who can take on, you know, at the forums and the seminars and on TV, the concept. But we've got to make sure we don't fall into the traps and do th start doing things to cater to that or to oppose that. Um, I think most of the people in this room have a pretty good sense of what makes good journalism. And when political candidates for their own purposes do what the president has done, you can really not counter except, by, except do your job the right way, I think. There's a piece of uh, video that might uh, illustrate my point, I think, every few weeks or however often it is that the president goes off to one of these shows. Um, uh, I've been able to find, they're not cutaways, I don't know what you call, yeah, anyway, uh, pictures of the, of the press pen uh, mm -hmm. uh, about an hour before the event. And you see our children and grandchildren arriving there and you see the taunting in your face, and at times it's almost physical. It's always extremely loud. And I'm struck at the quiet dignity of these people who just go into the pen and, and do their work and leave and don't pay any attention to what's happening. Uh, it's a nice example of what's, I mean, grace under pressure. I think uh, the accusation of fake news hurts. Hmm. Uh, it, it hurts those of us who believe in the fourth estate, who believe that um, in what we were doing, uh, that we pursued a 
worthy profession. And uh, we were after, uh, we were trying to right the wrongs of uh, government or society or um, social ills. And we considered it an honorable profession. And even though others don't consider us uh, pursuing an honorable profession, I think there are plenty of reporters today who are still ha who still have that mindset. Yeah. Um, granted, there's a whole section <coughs> of people who don't, and and they engage in opinion and they engage in in biased reporting. But honestly, you know, my old friends, my old colleagues, the people that I knew, were honest people who yeah. were just pursuing the truth. They just know one thing. She's being very erudite and wise and eloquent. But I guarantee you, if anybody in 1972 had treated Connie the way some of these fake news criers do today, <laughs> she'd have flattened them on the <laughs> 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 and with that, Ed, 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 do you have any final words? Yeah. No, I can't top that. No, they're very hard to top. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah, thank you, George.